Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Eagleton, where we're celebrating tonight the, uh, the launch of a book by the two gentlemen, or edited by the two gentlemen sitting with me. Uh, to my left is Bob Holmes. Uh, I've known Bob for a long time now. Uh, he is a clinical law professor uh, at Rutgers up in Newark, and uh, at least when I was dean, the clinic he runs, which focuses on transactional law uh, in an urban setting, uh, is the most popular clinic at the school. I think that's probably still true. Uh, Bob has a uh, distinguished career, aside from being a law professor, he was a partner at Wentz, Goldman, and Spitzer, and actually served in the early days of, of uh, the mayor's administration, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. To my right, Richard Roper, who's uh, currently a reluctant member of the Board of Governors <laughs> of Rutgers <laughs> University, <laughs> and a longtime friend of the Eagleton Institute. Uh, I've known Richard also for a long time. We served together uh, on the Advisory Committee for Judicial Conduct for several years. Uh, and Richard also was indispensable uh, to me uh, when I was the, um, uh, the chair of the, uh, the board of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. And Richard was really uh, stepped in at a time when we needed leadership and really provided it. So uh, I'm honored to be with these guys tonight. Uh, and they're here to talk about um, their book <coughs> called A Mayor for All the People, uh, which it recounts the, uh, the story of Mayor Kenneth Gibson, the first uh, black mayor elected in the Northeast uh, United States, and uh, they do it in a very unusual way. It's almost like, it's almost like the Synoptic Gospels, you know, in the, in the Bible, where uh, each each version has some some slight variances. But when you read the whole, you get an impression uh, of of the figure they're talking about. And so uh, that's the approach that that uh, Richard and <coughs> and and uh, Bob have taken with with uh, the story of Kenneth Gibson. Uh, and I'll let each of them uh, talk for about five minutes about the project and their background and what led them to this, and then we'll get into a conversation for about a half an hour, after which we will have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and the audience, by the way, uh, includes some uh, uh, participants in the book, uh, including the mayor's brother, uh, who's here tonight, and Harold Hodes, who's here tonight, and I'm sure there are others. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from them as well. Um, uh, but why don't we start with you, Bob, uh, as you wrote the introduction to the book. Give us some background on, on the approach you took and, and why you thought this was an important undertaking. Let me start with how I know and uh, feel close to the man known as Kenneth Allen Gibson. I was finishing my law school career at Harvard Law School in December of 1970, the same year Ken was elected the first African-American mayor of the city of Newark and of any nor major northeastern city. Uh, just as a short uh, parenthetical, I was a semester behind my class because I spent six months as in the National Guard doing my active duty. Uh, so I was getting out of Harvard in December as opposed to the previous May. A guy named Junius Williams who had been Ken Gibson's campaign manager and a uh, major part of his administration heading the Model Cities program came to Harvard to recruit people to join that administration. I had family and friends in Newark and while Wall Street, John beckoned some, uh, I, was, I was caused to take the uh, challenge and I came to Newark in 19, early 1971 to join the Gibson administration. I give you that background and now I'll tell you what I came to do. I was hired to be the director of a nonprofit entity called the Newark Housing Development and Rehabilitation Corporation, HDRC. Ken Gibson had three nonprofits as quasi-governmental entities to supplement city departments. And that becomes relevant when you start to read this book. Having nonprofits certainly created some levels of flexibility, some heightened levels of control perhaps over how he could manage city government, but there were detractors as well as to whether or not it was wise to run government through quasi-governmental entities, nonprofits, uh, one of which I was hired to manage. Roger Lowenstein points out in the book, for example, that he thought Ken allowed too many fiefdoms in his administration. There were semi-autonomous entities, uh, and that might not have been a good thing. Diane Johnson, who is the regional administrator of HUD, makes a similar point in the book that she could sometimes not be sure who she was speaking to because there were, as she put it, too many cooks in the kitchen. That was the metaphor she used. So there are people who thought that using s separate entities uh, and letting them have enormous autonomy might not have been the best way to run city government, and I'm part and parcel of, of that. 
Uh, I actually came back to Newark after a stint in state government uh, to run another of his nonprofits called the Newark Watershed Corporation. The third of those three is one called the Newark Economic Development Corporation, NEDC. Many of you may know the name Al Fiella, who headed that agency. The watershed was first headed by a person named Terry Moore. So I give you that background to suggest that in the book, there are people who thought that that was not an appropriate way to manage city government, and I was, uh, initially came to the city uh, in that capacity. That's probably more than five minutes, John, so I could talk more about the origins of the book, but I'll come back to that. Let Richard give you his background. Okay, well. Richard. My turn, right. Um, I, uh, like Bob, I was uh, in graduate school when Ken was elected in uh, 1970. And as a matter of fact, I was in May of uh, 1970. I was en route to my summer internship in London, England. I was doing my graduate work at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, and each of the master's degree candidates had to spend a summer working uh, as an intern in a major agency somewhere in the, in the United States, but often uh, some of us chose to go to Europe in, instead. Um, when I returned to, um, uh, to the Wilson School and was about to finish, I was approached by a friend like Bob was approached by um, Junius Williams by a guy by the name of um, Robert Curvin, who had been on the faculty, adjunct faculty at Rutgers Newark, and who I did not take a class from but got to know. And as a result of that, he got uh, interested in my returning to Newark once I completed my master's uh, to help Ken because he had been instrumental in helping to uh, get Ken elected mayor. And I ultimately decided to follow his advice. I visited with Ken and uh, with a guy by the name of Jack Kroskopf, who was heading something called the Office of Newark Metropolitan Studies, a specially designed uh, entity outside of City Hall uh, where people interested in working for uh, the city but not interested in working under city government might contribute to the, um, to the advancement of the mayor's agenda. I joined that staff and worked for a year, came to state government, worked for a year, went back to Newark to work for another organization, and Ken recruited me back to City Hall to be his uh, legislative aide representing the city in Trenton with the governor's office in the legislature. Uh, after spending two years doing that, I was then asked by Ken to take over the directorship of the Office of Newark Studies, which I did for four years. We'll talk a little bit more about the kinds of things the office did that might be of, of, of relevance to this conversation, uh, but I'll get back to, uh, to John. So um, reading the book, as I, I was telling these guys, I just finished it about 20 minutes ago, <laughs> but I was struck by the... Um, it seemed, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but um, the, uh, the book sort of grew out of a sense of dissatisfaction with the way that the mayor was being remembered. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and how that sense of dissatisfaction grew into this project? A third person who could possibly be sitting here, he's not an editor per se, but was part of the team that got this project together is a guy named George Hampton. Uh, George and I were in the presence of Ken Gibson one day we were talking about what had been written, not specifically about him, but about his 16 years in office, mostly negative. Ken was not so discouraged with the negativity as the lack of balance. He said, there's more to this story. Somebody should tell it. Uh, you don't have to tell all the good stuff. Just show a little more balance. So we took that as a beginning point uh, to see if we could do that. Our approach to make sure we accomplished balance and not bias because we were friends of his and had worked for him, we approached it, and the reason we're called editors, we approached nearly 50 individuals who had been around Ken Gibson during his 16 years, and we asked their positions about him. We didn't coach them. We didn't give them specific questions to answer. We said, tell us your impressions of the man named Kenneth Gibson and the 16 years he served as mayor. And Richard and I labored over those uh, and edited those, and that is the book, in effect, why we are editors. We put a compilation together. I was inspired, if you know anything about a, a tradition in West Africa called griots. Griots are the memory of the community. They are called upon to hand down the information from one generation to another. They're not historians, and neither are we. We are the griots, and we then hope brought together 
40 some other people. So it's a collective memory. That's what it is. The book is a collective memory, a tapestry of, <coughs> of reflections and perspectives given to us by a large number of people. And we hope that tapestry, when put all together, will paint in a more appropriate picture than had uh, been painted before. The other point I'd make, John, uh, you'll find, uh, since you've read it, you know this is a fact, it's not just about Ken Gibson, the man. It's also about the city of Newark. So you will s read lots of pieces that will tell you more about the city, the time that Ken was in office, what was going on at the time, the challenges he faced, and put that in perspective and what it took to be the mayor of a, of a large uh, northeastern city at the time. And that's, yeah, go ahead, Richard. I was going to say that uh, in the conclusion, the three sections of the conclusion address the mayor, the man, the time, and the place. Each of those were important to us as we thought about how to pull this document together. We wanted to get the views of people who had been involved in one way or another, either with Ken or with some aspect of Newark. And then we wanted to look across their reflections to see if we could paint a picture, if you will, a tapestry of what might be regarded as the legacy of Ken Gibson as the first African mayor of a major northeastern city. So for the benefit of the students here uh, who may not know this, could you give us some, con give us some of that context? And you know, what was the situation in Newark and how did Kenneth Gibson's family arrive in the midst of the Great Migration? And, and give us, set the stage for his, his, uh, his run for mayor and his win. Okay, Ken, Ken was born in uh, Enterprise, Alabama, and he was born in 1932. He died, by the way, uh, earlier this year. Uh, he was 86 years old. Uh, he came to Newark at the age of eight with his brother Harold and his parents. Um, he graduated from uh, Central High School in Newark. Uh, he uh, got a job in a factory for a while and then went to um, uh, what's, what's, what's called uh, no, it was a uh, Newark College of Engineering but he was there for only a couple of months because he didn't have the money necessary to complete his education so he went into the army did a stint in the in the in the uh, in the army and came when he came home he returned to NJI in what is now NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, and finished his degree at night. He then went to work for um, uh, the state of New Jersey, the highway department. He worked for the Newark Housing Authority as an engineer, I think a structural engineer. And then he worked for the city of Newark. And in 1970, uh, when he was elected mayor, he quit his job, obviously, as an engineer to, to take on the executive leadership of the city. Um, Ken was... Uh, I'll, I'll say a few things about him, and then, Bob, you can talk a little bit about uh, Ken was regarded um, as the stalking horse, if you will, for the first uh, black leader of the city of Newark. In 1966, he was uh, recruited, if you will, or he volunteered to be a, 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 a lamb taken to the slaughter, if you will. He ran for mayor in 66 knowing that that was not going to be successful. He knew that uh, the forces that existed at that time would not, uh, would not result in a successful outcome. But four years later, as a result of um, the black and Puerto Rican community coming together, uh, he was selected by a coalition of black and Puerto Ricans at the Black and Puerto Rican Convention to be the nominee for the office of mayor. And with that coalition, he was successful. I'll stop and let Bob talk a little bit. Well, the segue might be to the title of the book, uh, A Mayor for All the People. Uh, we wanted to put a question mark after it. The press decided we, we should not do that. <laughs> but there's a question, obviously. I don't know if anyone other than those who read Greek uh, philosophy know Aesop, who said, and a man who seeks to please everyone pleases no one. I think that's probably a fair assessment of the Gibson legacy. He, he set out to be a mayor for all the people, uh, not just those who had come together, as Richard pointed out, the African-American and Puerto Rican communities that came together to launch him into that position. He thought his position was important enough that he had to expand that base into all of the uh, areas of the city. 
Uh, the North Ward, which was predominantly Italian, had a man named Steve Adubato, many may know that name, who had come out in support of Ken Gibson from the North Ward, which was a risky business for him to undertake. Uh, you will read in the book accounts by his wife, Fran, and his son, Steve, who will tell you the horrific things that they had to in endure because Steve Adubato uh, endorsed Ken Gibson in 1970 from the North Ward. Uh, when people like Tony Imperiali and others were absolutely adamantly opposed to it. Uh, but it's important to, to understand that there were enormous racial tensions in the city at that time, just enormous racial tensions. And Ken wanted to bridge those. Some of the reflections will say Ken Gibson as an engineer was not a disruptor or an organizer. He was a, and I don't think they meant a pun when they said he was a bridge builder. Maybe they did mean it to be a pun. Ken was more bridge builder. He was intent upon on healing his city after a 1967 rebellion. And he thought to do that, he had to engage all the residents of the city. So again, the title of the book, A Mayor for All the People, really is a question that we're raising in the book. Is it even possible? Uh, or can his legacy uh, possibly survive attempting to be a mayor for all the people? Let me make two other comments about, in terms of context. 19, by 1970, uh, Newark was uh, a fiscal basket. Uh, it had been a economic powerhouse in the early uh, uh, 20th century. Between 1900 and 1940, thereabouts, uh, it was a dynamic economic engine. Uh, but by 1970, it had become uh, a majority poor and a majority minority city, black and Latina, Tinex. Uh, middle class blacks and whites in general had departed the city. Uh, its population had dropped from a high of 400 and about 30,000 people uh, to about 340,000 people by the time uh, Ken was elected. Uh, when Ken took office in 1970, uh, he inherited a municipal uh, def budget deficit of $65 million and didn't have a clue as to how that gap would be filled uh, during his first uh, year in office. Um, the 1970s were also a period in American life when the concept of black power was emerging and had in fact gained ascendance in some segments of the uh, African American community and many of the people who were uh, strong supporters of Ken's election, led by uh, the poet Imamu Baraka, were uh, uh, of the view that Ken should reflect in his administration a black power orientation. And Bob has indicated that the mayor didn't share that as his responsibility. He saw himself as a mayor of all the people. He was concerned about the black community. He was concerned about the Latinx community. But he wanted to ensure that he was seen as someone who cared about all of the people, uh, all of his constituents in the city of Newark. So you have this uh, incredibly tense city uh, where it would be a challenge for anybody to be the mayor of all the people. You had the Newark Rebellion three years prior. Uh, you had a situation where jobs were leaving the city. Uh, and there was white flight going on, and just as, just as the African community was arriving, the, the industrial base was drying up, uh, and then you had, um, I think, uh, the poet Baraka actually spearheaded the convention, right, yeah. that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that drove him to power. Uh, so you'd think that the, um, you know, the rage that was there would have produced a real um, a rabble riser as the mayor, but in fact, uh, uh, Mayor Gibson himself, when asked what kind of personality type he was, was he type A? He said, I'm type Z. <laughs> and uh, I was struck reading the book by the, the parallels, really, between his personality and Barack Obama's. Um, uh, this preternatural calm that they both had, the absolutely uh, horrible conditions under which uh, they took office, uh, and the sense uh, shortly thereafter, um, as you mentioned, trying to be mayor for all the people, a little bit of betrayal uh, and disappointment. Um, do you think that um, is just the, the, the nature of his personality one of his achievements in, in bringing calm to a city that, that was really on edge? 
One of the things I sought to accomplish was to find Ken Gibson's proper place in history. Is he an historic figure? Is it enough, or do you, can you be an historic figure beyond simply being a first? What did Ken leave behind that would cause us to have him be called an historic figure? One of the tests that I found in Atlantic Magazine by a series of historians is whether a person was a peculiar personality for the particular time in which they served. They used names like Abraham Lincoln, Civil War, George Washington, Revolutionary War. Many of our uh, reminiscences and reflections suggest that Kem Gibson was the perfect personality for the time. Dwight Eisenhower was probably the perfect president to come in after World War II. There were people who were just uniquely suited for the particular time. Uh, Ken was not a rabble rouser, but Newark was under a watch of a riot that might begin again. The New York Times suggested that Newark was a tinderbox. It had erupted and could erupt again any time. A personality other than Ken's might have led to that coming to fruition. Uh, so I think uh, there's an agreement in our book that Ken was the right person for the time. I just want to add one thing, Richard, before you take that. I have an interesting quote from uh, when you talk about the power that a mayor has to be a mayor for all the people. Uh, LBJ, when he was asked what it meant to be the president of the United States, how hard it was, he said, it could be a lot worse. I could be a mayor. <laughs> So, right? <laughs> so you get an idea what, what the President of the United States thought it would be to try to run a major city in this country. He thought it was easier to run, it from, run the whole country from the White House. Yeah, I think uh, the mayor's um, phlegmatic personality, I guess you would call it, his calmness was uh, referenced by any number of the 46 uh, contributors to the volume. Uh, they all talked about how he was able to maintain this attitude of calmness under all circumstances. And there are two instances, I'll talk about one and Bob will talk about the other, in which uh, that personality was demonstrated. The first of which had to do with his selection of a police captain for um, the police precinct in the North Ward of Newark, which at the time was predominantly Italian. And the uh, Italian leadership in the ward uh, was not happy with his choice and insisted that he change uh, the, the selection. And the mayor refused to do this. The um, North Ward councilman uh, serving the guy serving on the Newark Municipal Council representing the North Ward led a contingent of uh, North Ward residents, a mob really, into the mayor's office. They broke in the door and insisted um, under threat of physical harm that he change his mind. And uh, it is recounted by those who were in the room, I was not, that he sat behind his desk eating grapes. <laughs> I kid you not, the man, and any, any other circumstance, his guards, his security force would have shot, could have shot someone for breaking into the mayor's office. But he sat there and because of his phlegmatic personality, uh, his phlegmatic demeanor, uh, nothing transpired beyond the, the door being dis destroyed. Bob? Well, before I give the other uh, anecdotal piece, uh, to that same point, you might remember John Abscam. We lost some pretty impressive political figures during Abscam. They tried to take Ken down. Yeah. Yeah, Not awesome. only was Ken calm, he was also very wise. Very, very shrewd. Very shrewd. People underestimated him because he was calm, that he was very shrewd. He did not allow himself to be set up when the Abscam people came to try to uh, take him down. Uh, just a little anecdotal piece. The one story that I have, I was, before uh, doing some other things, was the executive director of the Newark Watershed Corporation. Uh, the city of Newark is the owner of 35,000 contiguous acres of real estate in five townships and three counties. Uh, it goes back to Richard's point of being a manufacturing mecca when they needed good water supply for leather and all kinds of other things that the city was involved with. So the city owns a watershed. I was the director. 
we dared, or Terry Moore before me, dared to come up with a development plan for the watershed in safe zones. Uh, we don't have to talk about the environmental impacts, but not all 35 acres, 35,000 acres were essential to the water supply. There was a conservation and development plan developed that would call for some of it to be developed. I attended planning board meetings in West Milford, uh, and the short version of the story is there were times when I needed uh, the state police to get me out of town. <laughs> the town people in those towns where the city of Newark owns its watershed lands, Kinnelon, West Milford, Vernon, I hope no one's from those towns, I'm <laughs> talking badly about them, but th there was such an outrage that we dared to bring some idea of a Newark based development to those towns that my life was literally threatened. I recall it in my reflections in the book. I was called very ugly names and uh, I had to get police to get me out of town. The reason Richard called on me to do that, to comment on Ken's demeanor, there was one instance where they demanded that I bring the mayor. Enough of you Holmes, we want to see the main man. Uh, so I did. I invited Ken. He had just landed from a trip to Asia. He was tired. He said, Ken, I'm sorry to do this to you, but these folks are insisting that they meet you. So he came. And this is a hostile. I'm, these folks wanted him so they could do something. They were mad. They were angry. In that same incredibly calm demeanor, he calmed this crowd down. We never built anything there, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but he did calm the crowd down that night. Uh, the other side of that coin, by the way, they were billing the city. This is an interesting side part, John. Municipalities should be tax exempt on properties they own. There's an exception in the New Jersey law where watershed properties are not tax exempt. So the city of Newark was paying millions of dollars in taxes to a community that also denied development rights. You can't have it both ways. You can't tell us that you can't build and then file, a, you know, have us pay taxes. So uh, through a person named Phil Elberg, who I hired to help me with this, we were winning, having a wonderful time winning tax appeals while we were losing in the development, uh, in the development course. Just one quick other anecdotal story. Uh, one person in one of the towns, I'm not going to name the town this time, asked me this question. Mr. Holmes, if you build houses here in our town, Will Mayor Gibson be the mayor of that part of this town? <laughs> I tell you. I wasn't sure how to answer. I wanted to be sure I wanted to laugh, cry, run out the door. No, madam, your mayor will still be the mayor of that part of the town. But that was the level of discomfort that they had with me possibly bringing development to those communities. John, let me add a coda, let me add a coda to the uh, breaking into the mayor's office by the North Ward Councilman. Um, the, there is a section of the book where uh, we, we have reflections provided by Mayor Gibson, and we asked him questions not related to the comments of the uh, contributors, but questions we thought uh, 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 the public would be interested in uh, because of who he was and what he, what he attempted to do in Newark. Uh, so we asked him about the council person breaking into his office with uh, a mob of, of his uh, constituents. And he said, well, yeah, I sat there very quietly eating grapes, but I had a 38 in my lap. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe him. So <laughs> his brother is nodding his head. <laughs> <laughs> That's the prudent part. Right? <laughs> That's the prudent part. So, getting the, so the, some of the, um, I guess, harshest uh, criticism in the book has to do with the North Ward, and uh, and I, I, for, I forget exactly who it was, but the, um, uh, I guess, the Puerto Rican community in particular felt that by making that, uh, having that arrangement with the Italians in the North Ward, that was a, uh, that, that had the effect of sort of keeping them down. Do you think any of that criticism is justified and and um, uh, what choice did the mayor have given the support he received from uh, yeah. from the North Ward? Um, I, I, I don't think um, the Puerto Rican community blamed uh, the leadership of the North Ward for their perception that Ken was not as responsive to that community, the Puerto Rican community, as he should have been given the, the coalition that had been formed to get him elected in the first instance. Um, I think the Puerto Rican community felt that uh, they had been uh, given the short end of the stick. Uh, they assumed that they would have representation 
on the city council, that they would have some degree of visibility in uh, uh, the administration, high visibility, not just visibility, but high visi visibility. And um, there is, was and is a uniform sense that that didn't happen, and they felt that they had, um, they had been mistreated. And I think that attitude is reflected in the reflections, yeah. Senator Ron Rice simply says he did not need to support anybody in the North War. They weren't going to vote for him anyway. So there was no quid pro quo. Steve Adubato had gone out on a limb to support him, but he didn't bring an electorate behind him to sustain that electability in the next elections. And Ken did get elected three more times. Uh, Ron Rice simply says he should have directed those resources away from the North Ward and to other parts of the city. But, but let me f make this point, though. Because of the disaffection between the Puerto Rican community and the mayor, uh, Puerto Ricans began to replace uh, Italians in the North Ward. They, they, that, that ward is now majority Puerto Rican. Uh, and Steve Adubato wisely or shrewdly realized that the Puerto Rican community was going to be very, very important to the North Ward's continuing political viability. He embraced the Puerto Rican community as the Italians left. He took in the Puerto Ricans and built up uh, their presence in the political arena. Unfortunately, that worked to the mayor's disadvantage because instead of having the Puerto Ricans working with and for him, they were working with uh, someone who was not uh, in his camp uh, in, in the sense that, uh, that uh, the black community was. You know, I was a, a bit surprised when you interviewed the mayor and asked him what he considered his greatest achievement, uh, that his answer was uh, improvements in health care. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not something I had heard before. Do you want to elaborate on that? What, what was the state of health care when he took office and what steps did the mayor take uh, to, to um, uh, rate that accomplishment? Infant mortality was alarmingly high, tuberculosis rates were alarmingly high, and there were other terrible things that were going on in Newark. And the mayor took that on as one of his major uh, goals. And I guess the first approach, and I was director of the Housing and Development Rehabilitation Corporation at the time, he wanted to build a series of community health facilities neighborhood health care facilities, clinics, as opposed to folks having to go to Martlin or to one of the major hospitals. And he did. We ended up with seven in the city. And it made an enormous difference. And there was nothing written about it. And I think that back, John, is to Ken's point, tell people about the things we did. Yeah. We built health clinics around the city that changed the health disparity in the city. Infant mortality dropped dramatically, tuberculosis rate dropped dramatically, and other diseases dropped dramatically because of the position of those uh, health facilities. What's the Nork uh, emergency, emergency Services for, fam Nork Nork emergency emergency services services for, for Families? families. Yeah. Enormous contribution. Another place where people could go to get service that was not provided before that created uh, better lives uh, and health uh, issues. And that, I think, was the mayor's most important for him. Uh, outcome for his, his, his yeah. administration. Yeah, but he also um, innovated a number of uh, uh, interesting um, projects. The uh, creation of what is today WBGL FM jazz radio station, uh, what is it, FM 88. Um, it is the region's premier jazz outlet, uh, radio outlet. Uh, the uh, work of uh, uh, Newark Emergency Services for Families, the, uh, the work that uh, the Institute, um, I get, I'm, I'm losing it, the work of um, the task force that the mayor put in place that led to the establishment of legislation, the enactment of legislation, creating the state program of payments in lieu of taxes to municipalities with state-owned property. I mean, there are several others that I'll talk about as we get into this. Yeah, and I think, um, it's just from my, my background, Hubert Williams' uh, work as the police commissioner um, accomplished a lot. I mean, those things are always perishable. <laughs> uh, and I think there was some backsliding after he left. But, um, but they were real innovators in terms of community policing as that started to evolve um, in the early 1980s. And, um, and I think that was a very significant appointment uh, as well. Yeah, I think Hubert was perhaps one of the mayor's uh, 
most successful uh, appointments to the director level, especially given uh, the critical nature of police services, uh, the need to improve community and police relations in Newark. Uh, Hubert was very successful in advancing the concept of pol uh, community policing in the city of Newark and his work, as a matter of fact, uh, resulted in uh, him being um, elected the president of the Police Foundation once he uh, retired from uh, his role as director of police di director in Newark. John, let me go back to the watershed for just a moment because I think there's an important uh, legacy there. Hugh Adnizio, who was Ken's predecessor as mayor of the city of Newark, attempted just before he left office to sell the watershed off to his friends. Can't put it any more bluntly than that. He was going to sell that 35,000 acres off to his friends. Ken hired a lawyer named Len Weinglass. Many will know him as a very prominent lawyer in the state of New Jersey. Uh, to stop that, and they together campaigned to protect 35,000 pristine acres for the future of the city of Newark uh, against what would have been a sell-off by Adnizio and his friends. Uh, a little quick story Phil tells us. Uh, Lenny said, I'll charge you just a dollar for this service, Mayor. When we asked him, he said, no, he never got the dollar. <laughs> Just uh, circling back then on Hubert Williams, uh, fast forward a few years um, when I was Attorney General and we had to deal with racial profiling in the New Jersey State Police, uh, we went to the Police Foundation and Hubert was the president and uh, we brought a lot of the concepts that he had originally developed in Newark to bear on the state police reforms that we accomplished. So I think that's, a, that's an enduring legacy as well. Um, so at the end of the day, when you, sort of, when you, when you look at the book as a whole, um, and you're, you, you start the book by raising the question of what kind of historical figure was he. What do you come away with? I come away with what Bonnie Watson, con Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, puts in the forward that when she points out that there were 35,000 uh, cities and towns in the United States, and out of those towns there were probably millions of mayors that have been elected over those years, how many do we remember? How many can we name? Very few. She says Ken Gibson's name will resonate throughout history and therefore he is a historic figure just based on, on that fact alone. My two takeaways, John, I take from his two slogans. Unfortunately, both of his campaign slogans backfired. <laughs> Wherever cities are going, Newark will get there first. Newark didn't get there first. Seattle, Boston, Cleveland, name them. San Antonio, San Jose, lots of cities came along in that same time period and moved much further ahead than Newark. So he had to kind of eat his words with wherever cities are, are going. And a mayor for all the people. Hysop is clear, you cannot be, you cannot please everyone, you're gonna please no one. So I think his legacy may hang on the interpretation we give to those two slogans that he put forward, but then really couldn't, couldn't live up to. Uh, but there's an enduring legacy that we've started to talk about that needs to be pointed out, and I think the book does that. I think people are mindful of the fact that behind all of the difficulties, uh, as Richard and I look and talk to each other about it, the New York Times still talks about Newark in terms of the 1967 rebellion. Let it go for, I mean, give us a break. <laughs> you know, 1967 is a long time ago. We've outlived that. You can't keep painting Newark as if it's the city that erupted in 1967. That's over. What they still do, the media, not just the Times, but the yeah. media generally has painted Newark into that corner as the city that blew up and, oh, it might blow up any day again. Got to get past that. So the legacy, I think, uh, is unfairly painted. And I think given those circumstances, Ken did an extraordinary job to bring his city out of those ashes and to where we see the city th thriving at today. Yeah, I, I think um, what we were saying earlier about uh, the uniqueness of his personality for the times in which he was called upon to serve and the, um, the, the extent to which that personality allowed him uh, to pull together a community that had been ripped apart no, no, no more than three years before that. So I think that is um, something that we have to acknowledge was a contribution, a unique contribution by Ken. I think there's a second uh, important contribution that he made that has not been uh, acknowledged, at least not publicly acknowledged. I think those of us 
on the inside acknowledge it, and that is the extent to which he brought into uh, local government, city government in Newark, young professionals who were interested in public affairs and who were successful as leaders under his, in his administration. The, the young men, primarily men, and some women, who he recruited from Harvard and Princeton and Rutgers and the University of Pennsylvania, um, from Yale, from the law schools of Harvard and, and, and Rutgers and, and, uh, and, and Yale, who took on challenges because they were inspired by the opportunity to assist uh, an African American trying to make a difference in a place that was regarded as almost a lost cause. Uh, their contributions, I, I think, provided a base work for what would, would, what would follow. John, just one other. In a study done by Penn State, they, they were asked who were the greatest mayors of all time. There was a consensus on Fiorello LaGuardia and the New York City. The reason Fiorello LaGuardia was considered the greatest of all time was that he changed the perception of how people saw his ethnic group. That people thought Italians were mm -hmm. X and could not govern a city. Ken had to do that for his ethnic group. And I can assure you it was much more difficult for an African American mayor than an Italian mayor to do that, to change the perception of how people believed that an African American man could manage a major northeastern city. That's what I think he overcame most, proved that he could do it, proved he could do it four terms worth, and I think his legacy is embedded in, I think with a, a comparison to a Fiorello LaGuardia, he did exactly that for the African American community. Yeah, one of the, uh, one of the passages in the book recounts that um, uh, whoever wrote it was that down in Alabama uh, shortly after the mayor was elected. And even Marty that, Beerbaum. Yeah, and, and that um, the kids in Alabama uh, knew that um, somebody from Alabama, from their community, was just elected the mayor of a major American city. So that in and of itself is a legacy. And that the other things that I'm left with is the, the calmness mm -hmm. that was needed at the time. Uh, and we used to say when I was in the governor's office, you know, success is a second term. Uh, you know, you know, if, if you, if, if, you know, because you get beat up every day, and it's hard. It's easy to lose yep. sight of whether Absolutely. you're succeeding or not. Absolutely. You know, he had four terms, yep. so that in and of itself, yep. in a very difficult environment, speaks volumes. So, um, with that, I think we'll go to questions from the audience. We have a microphone. That, if you raise your hand, we will provide you with the mic and feel free to ask. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, if you would please uh, state your name, where you're from, and keep your questions brief, so we get as many questions as we can tonight. I'll be walking around with the microphone. Right, Bill, right in front of me. <clears throat> Thank you for an excellent presentation. I have one question. I think Ken Gibson was the greatest mayor that Newark ever had, and one of the great mayors of the United States. My name is Gary Maturin. I'm 82 years old. I'm a social justice and civil rights activist. I have one question for all three of you. How do you compare the legacy of Ken Gibson, who I met twice, with a young man who's running for the presidency, whose constituents cannot reach him when he was the mayor, and now he's running for the United States Senate, with a one to two percent election possibility? Could you answer that question, please? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> that means you should answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm the moderator. <laughs> I interviewed one of the state's most popular governors, Tom Kane, on that, pretty much on that question. And Tom Kane's answer was, Ken was all about the city of Newark. He was not aspiring to do anything other than that. He wanted to treat and serve his city. The mayor... Uh, after him that you alluded to probably was not in that, of that same ilk. Um, and that's what Tom Kane thought was important about Ken, that he was totally committed. On the other side of that coin, we have people in the book who criticized that because they said he understated the potential power he might have had, that he should have aspired to take more of a power position in the county, in the state, and perhaps in the nation. So there might be two edges to that sword. 
But to your point, he was totally and totally committed to and dedicated to the city of Newark. I agree with that. <laughs> that makes three of us. <laughs> they owe me. <laughs> that was very diplomatic. <laughs> I'm Cliff Zook and I uh, just retired as a professor at Rutgers. Can you answer the question now, if you put that at the end for all the people with a question mark, is that answerable in history? In other words, was he that transitional figure that made so much of an impact on the city that even if the times were so conflictual that he wasn't able to be a mayor for all the city, his legacy left it so that someone could be? Yeah. Um, uh, I think he tried very hard to uh, reach out to all of his constituents and to uh, be someone who, it, who was perceived as being responsive uh, to all of those constituents. But the expectations were such, uh, both in the black and Latinx community and in the uh, opposition communities, if you will, it simply wasn't possible for that to be realized. It, the Italian community, f during the first two terms that he was in office, simply could not and would not embrace him. So th that was, and I think the African American um, black power constituents were so disappointed uh, because he attempted to be the mayor of all the people that they were unable to come back under the tent uh, when the opportunity to get, uh, to reelect him uh, arose. Uh, much like Obama's, um, expecta the expectations that arose around the Obama election, they were similar to the expectations that surrounded Ken Gibson when he was elected. And in both instances, those expectations were uh, unrealistic. When we asked Ken what one of his greatest disappointments about his own uh, 16 years, the Hispanic community had a little rebellion of its own in 1974, started in Branchbrook Park. Ken was very disappointed that he was not able to bring them into his office and make them feel better about the city, uh, that they should not have felt the need to have a rebellion. People lost their lives. It wasn't as dramatic as the 1967 rebellion, but it was serious. People lost their lives, property was damaged, and the mayor felt badly to the end of his life that he did not have a better opportunity to make that community feel more comfortable in the city of North. Thank you. My name is Deborah Shuford, and I am a graduate of Arts High in Newark, also a graduate of Douglas College here at Rutgers. And what I remember about Mayor Gibson, uh, when we registered to vote in the high schools, um, at Arts High School, and I was able to vote for him. And my parents are from Alabama, and they migrated to New Jersey in 1954. Um, and what I do remember my, my dad, my late dad, who passed away four years ago, saying, what Mayor Gibson gave us was hope. He gave us hope, and that's all we needed. And that's what we have today. He gave us hope. We still have that. Thank you. I think that's right. I'm John Weingarten, I work here. I wonder where you, th Ken, Ken Gibson did run for governor and got further than I think any African American has since in, in finishing third, I think. Where, where did that fit in with the idea that he was only focused on the city? Uh, that happened in 81 and again in 85, I think it was, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a good question because his, many of his supporters wanted him to be a much more active black political leader in the county and to, in collaboration with black legislators, to become more active as a black political leader statewide. And he showed no interest in either of those. And there's a, there's a piece in the book about uh, the attempts on the part of his staff uh, in Newark to get him to take on the county Democratic chairmanship uh, 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 
position, if you will, and he, he said he wasn't interested in that. So when he ran for governor in 81, it was quite a surprise, I think, to, a many, to many people. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't involved in that, in either of those races, so I don't know the thinking behind uh, what led him to make that decision or those decisions, but uh, it was out of character, if you will. Um, after he left office, he did run for the county executive position, and that was not successful either. And I'm not sure it's, there's a conflict between having a passion for your city and wanting to move to a level where you might have an opportunity to do even more for your city. I think if he was motivated at all in running for governor, it was because he thought he could use that platform to even do more things for uh, big cities in, in the state of New Jersey. It could also have simply been a function of having been in office for a decade and, yeah. and, and yeah. need to move on and explore broader horizons, I think. I'm uh, Pete Buxbaum. I worked for the ACLU in the city between 72 and 74 and clerked for the court before that, although now I'm living somewhere in the western part of New Jersey. Uh, it strikes me that one of Mayor Gibson's legacy was making the mayor of Newark a major figure. Try to think, other than Adenuzio, who he'd like to forget, does anyone know who was mayor before Ken Gibson? And I bet you everyone in this room about could name every mayor subsequent to him. So he's made the mayor, it seems to me, you know, common. That's, that's a good point. I think that's, that's, that's probably true. Uh, he was the first African-American mayor to become president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which also elevated him. And he won the Heinz Prize, uh, one of those uh, uh, performance in office kinds of uh, awards. So. Uh, I think because of his personality, because of uh, the things he attempted to do uh, and, the, and the visibility he gained as mayor, uh, he stands out among, among um, all of the leaders of Newark in the recent history. Hi, my name is Beatrice Adams. I'm a doctoral candidate in African American history here at Rutgers, New Brunswick. Um, we've been talking about the legacy of Gibson in a number of ways, and I'm just interested in putting it in conversation with some of the other prominent first black mayors we can think of. I'm thinking of maybe Washington and Chicago, and then Jackson and Atlanta, but any of them in particular. Richard Hatcher and Gary, Indiana. Carl Stokes. And Carl Cleveland. Stokes in Cleveland. There are distinctions. There are two major distinctions. First, they had a lot of political experience before they became mayor. Ken Gibson had none. He was an engineer, had never been elected to a, an office, had never run for office other than in 66, which is a stalking horse for someone else. So they were experienced politicians uh, in each case. There's another distinction. They all came out of that same uh, civil rights black power movement. I don't want to give them all credit for it, but I think most of them, if not all of them, embraced it more than Ken did, uh, and paid a price for it. Uh, you know, Richard Hatcher is not as beloved in Gary, Indiana as Ken was to his death in Newark because he alienated lots of people because he continued to raise the fist in the name of black power throughout his administration. Um, Maynard Jackson did it slightly differently by encouraging black businesses and so on, but he also had a very uh, Afrocentric focus to his administration. So there are distinctions in terms of how Ken approached uh, his city, mayor for all the people, and how the mayors you're pointing out who came along at a very similar time uh, addressed the same, the same situation. Yeah, I think the, the biggest difference is the Afrocentric orientation of many of the other mayors that, that Ken simply did not have. I think he'd probably be most like Harold Washington in Chicago. Um, and, and ha having to balance all these different ethnicities and different interests and tensions. But, um, he, but even, even he had an Afrocentric orientation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Derek Coates, and I am a Rutgers grad as well, an undergraduate. And I'm from New Jersey as well, and grew up in Asbury Park. And uh, for the sake of the students here, 
uh, this question really goes to them. And looking at uh, uh, Ken Gibson's legacy and how uh, we have the pros, the cons, the good, the bad, uh, at the time he was uh, mayor, uh, I was in Washington, D.C. And as you know, Washington, major black city as well. Uh, Marion Barry was the, pre uh, the governor, uh, excuse me, the mayor at that time. And could you just share a right with the audience about that type of parallel in addition to understanding uh, what we're looking at is a period of time and how time uh, really reflects upon what's going on at a period of time. Uh, Marion Berry is a special <laughs> character. Um, but you know, he, he did some, he did some very good things and he did some not so good things. Um, he served uh, an extended period, he left office for a while, came back to office. Um, I think overall he should be regarded as someone who wanted to make a big difference in Washington, uh, Washington DC government and he did have an impact. Uh, but it's, I guess I would have to say it was uneven. That's, that's what I would diplomatically say. The historians that I researched in Atlantic and Time magazines point out your historic significance are for both good and ill. You, you can be well known because of the good you left behind. You can also be historically significant for the ill. Uh, and they named some mayors from our obvious ones, Chicago and other cities, who left a lot of ill behind, and they're significantly significant for, for unfortunately, for that reason as well. So I think I agree. Marion Barry leaves an uneven legacy. Ken, while had a couple of ups and downs with the law, uh, never got convicted of anything. Uh, he was an anti-corruption mayor, and people see him, for the most part, as clean throughout his 16 years. Um, also part of his legacy, which we can't say for all mayors uh, throughout, the, throughout the country. We have time for what, maybe two more questions, and then we're gonna, uh, just so you know, we let the gentlemen make their way to the autograph table uh, after the questions are over, and then you can, you can raise more questions with them as you, as you, as you buy their books. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bernice Proctor Venable. I am a member emerita of the Board of Overseers here at Rutgers, and hello, Richard. Ah. <laughs> I am here. I was not born and raised, or did I go to school in uh, Newark, New Jersey. But I am from New Jersey, and I have to say that probably about the end of his 16 years as mayor, I became superintendent of schools in Irvington. And everything I ever heard about the mayor, and this is the reason why I came tonight, it was always something flattering, always something enduring about the kind of person he was. I don't care wherever I went in Newark and you know, coming down Springfield Avenue, if you're heading towards uh, the Atlantic Ocean, you have to land in Newark. Uh, but the most important thing that I wanted to mention is that whenever we had a problem in our district of Irvington, meaning fights with students, et cetera, et cetera, like you have in any major city, we would wind up taking the student not to the Irvington General Hospital, but the trauma center in Newark, or any other place uh, for health care that the city is known for. And I just wanted to make sure that people here understood and, and also understand that there are so many light bulbs in Newark that we never, ever, ever talk about. And I am so glad that you raised the issue about what he did for health. And let's not forget he was an engineer. There are many things that he did, the groundwork for what the present day Newark Rutgers looks like. He might not have lived to see a lot of things, but he did a lot in that regard, 
and so many other things that are going on in that city right now, if you look back or if you do a sequel, you might want to talk to people who were not born and raised in Newark, but knew a whole lot about Ken Gibson and the good that he did. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. So, many of the, uh, many of the uh, things you referenced or mentioned uh, are addressed in, in the volume. We talk about uh, the role he played in uh, the development, for example, of Society Hill, the moderate income housing complex that, abut that's, that abuts the downtown, that's not in downtown, but abuts the downtown, uh, the work of the Newark Watershed Corporation, which unfortunately no longer exists, the Housing and Redevelopment Corporation, WBGOFM, Newark Emergency Services for Families. Uh, there are a host of uh, innovations, things that were not being done elsewhere uh, in, in cities across the country that Ken was successful in, in developing. The, the housing centers, clinics, is not unique, but he stressed that and made it a part. The construction of the University of Medicine and Dentistry in a a limited area that uh, would have t would have destroyed uh, a community had it not been negotiated down in size, and the emergence of the higher education infrastructure in the city, led by Rutgers Newark, and NJIT, and Essex County College, and Seton Hall Law School, all of that uh, infrastructure that's now relating to the city in a very positive way. Uh, again, led by Rutgers University Newark. So, yeah, he did a lot of that. He, he provided the impetus for a lot of that. You know, it's a successful book. They're already talking about a sequel. <laughs> 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 One more question? Hi, uh, my name is Raj Takar, and I'm a technology analyst uh, based in Edison. Um, so you spoke of Ken's successes in the areas of uh, infant mortality and tuberculosis. Right? You also touched upon the fact that he was calm and shrewd. Right? So I'm kind of curious to understand what was uh, his impact on gun violence during his time? Oh boy. Um, um, Crime was a big problem in Newark. There's no question about that. And there were efforts. Oh, you, I, <laughs> I was born and raised in Newark, and I voted for Mayor Gibson the first time I was eligible to vote for Mayor Gibson. We didn't have a gun problem. We did not have a gun problem. I was born and raised there. I was born at Bethesda Hospital. I grew up in the weak section, the same section as Bill Brock. And we did not have a gun problem. I don't remember anyone getting I didn't come to Rutgers until 1977. I lived my entire life there. I spent my summers in Alabama, Lowell County, Alabama, with my grandparents and great grandparents. So we did not have a gun problem. Yeah. At all. We didn't, it, the city didn't have a gun problem, but it did have a crime problem. We have to acknowledge that. And, 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 and Hubert Williams, I think, was most successful in addressing uh, the crime incidents in Newark. He brought it down largely through his focus on uh, community policing. And that was, I think, a very big reason he ended up becoming the president of the Police Foundation. But crime was a problem, and it, it, and it continues to be a problem, but not at the, the, the extent to, to which it was then. And it was, a, it was a problem in every major city in the country, too. I don't think Newark was unique, was unique in that regard. So, okay, let's, um, we're going to make our way to the autograph table, but please thank Jeremy and thanking. Uh, <laughs>